Okay, welcome back Physics 30s to our next lesson in Chapter 2. This is 2.2 and today we're going to be looking at Coulomb's Law. In physics, we look a lot at forces. And in Physics 20, you looked a lot at the force of gravity. Now you have a lot of experience with gravitational force in your daily life. A gravitational force pulls pretty hard on masses and we can feel this when we try to fight against it and lift objects up and we can see it when it accelerates masses towards the ground. Okay, one! It's down, it's down, and... However, the electric force can be even stronger. You've probably seen this natural phenomenon before, which is called lightning. Lightning is an impressive and dangerous demonstration of the power of electric fields and charge. The basic idea is that during the day when the sun is heating the ground, the air on the ground gets hot, and just like a lava lamp, hot air rises. So this warm, moist air starts to go upwards. Now when it goes high enough, it's going to start condensing into these clouds. And as the warm air continues to rush up, there is cooler air, which I'll put it here in blue, that is falling back down in this direction. So we have air rubbing past one another. So as the cool dust and ice in the clouds at the top fall and move past the hot moist air moving up, we get them rubbing and get this friction going on. And just like the balloon and the hair in the last video, we're going to get charging by friction. And when that hot air rushes up, it hits the colder and loses its electrons. So we get positive charges being left up at the top of the cloud. And the electrons that get stripped off, they stay at the bottom and build up on the underside of the cloud, making it negatively charged. Now the ground has charges as well. It's got pluses and minuses, kind of an infinite amount as we talked about before, as it's a very large surface. But when these electrons over here get a strong enough charge, they're going to repel other negatives. So they're gonna cause the negatives in the ground to move away. And now with those electrons moved away, we have an area of positive charge at the top of the cloud, lots of negatives at the bottom of the cloud, and again, positive on the ground. This has created a potential difference. You can kind of think of it like a battery, how we have a plus side and a negative side, and electrons want to go from the minus towards the plus. So we have plus, minus, plus. Now you might think, why don't the electrons just go to those plus areas and just neutralize right away? And the problem is this is kind of like a battery that is not hooked up. There's nothing connecting the plus area to the negative area because the air is not a good conductor. It's an insulator. So the electrons can't just flow through that air unless it makes its own path. In this video, we can see electrons trying to come down towards the ground through what's called step leaders. How they're doing this is they're ionizing the air to create a pathway to go down to the ground. So here we can see that the cloud at the top has all these negative charges and the air is kind of neutral because it's not a good conductor. It's got pluses and minuses. But if the negatives in the cloud charge up enough, they can push that electron in the air away, getting rid of that electron and leaving the air ionized or positively charged. Then the electrons can move to that new positive charge and push away the next electron. We can see this in the diagram as the electrons are making these pathways as it moves through the air. I'm showing in this green line showing that those are the electrons. Now the opposite is happening from the ground where it's creating plus charges that are moving up. And when a positive reaches a negative or a negative reaches a positive, then we've kind of created a conductor or a wire from the plus to the minus. And now the electrons are all going to flow down in that direction and we will get a lightning bolt. So that's what happens most commonly. Electrons from the bottom of the cloud shoot down towards the ground. But remember, based off law of conservation of charge, that would leave the cloud positive if that's all that happened. All the positives would remain up there. So some of the time you get electrons from the ground shooting up to that top of the cloud. And this is a farther distance, so it takes a larger potential difference or difference in charge, and it doesn't happen as regularly. However, when it has enough power to do this, it can be about 10 times more powerful than the electron to ground lightning strike and can become five times hotter than the sun. There's a lot of really interesting facts and understanding about how lightning works. And I found that this video had a lot of really useful information. So I'll link that in the classroom so you can go take a look at that video. And the cause of lightning has to do with the electrical force between charges. And that's what we're gonna be looking at in this lesson and calculating that force with Coulomb's law.
Our formula for Coulomb's law is Fe, or the electric force, is equal to kq1, q2 over r squared. Let's look what these parts are. k is Coulomb's constant. It's just a constant number that will always go into this formula. It's 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Basically, that unit just makes it out uh, so that when multiplied by the other variables, we're just going to get newtons as a result for force. Um, Q1 and Q2 are representing the charges involved in this electric force. We'll come back to that. And the radius means the distance between the two charges or the radius between the two charges. So I've had this electron here and another electron there. It's talking about how far apart they are. The reason we use R is because this could be in any direction. So it could be R there as well. And you can kind of picture this as a circle, poorly drawn circle for this case and the radius of that circle is how far apart the two charges are. So now let's take a closer look at charge. It's gonna be measured in coulombs. That's a unit of charge. And kind of like with moles for chemistry, we don't really weigh out one atom. It's really, really, really small and really, really, really light. So we have this big clump of atoms and say how much that weighs. We have grams per mole on the periodic table. For example, carbon is 12.01 grams per mole, which is not gram of one atom, it's gram per mole, a big amount of these atoms. So we're going to have that similar for charge. Instead of saying just the charge of one electron, that's really hard to measure as it's really, really tiny. So we get a large amount of electrons, 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons, and say that has a charge of one coulomb. So one coulomb is a fair amount of charge. Then we can just kind of work backwards and divide that coulomb by that amount of electrons. And say each, each electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Now I did put electron and proton here uh, because they each have the same amount of charge. It's just one's plus and one's minus. So a proton has positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs and an electron has negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So this means that if we have a plus and a minus, there's going to be an attractive force that we're gonna measure here. And if it's two same charges, two protons, or two electrons, we're gonna have a repulsive force. Now you may be thinking, this formula looks pretty familiar to a gravitational field, which it does. It looks nearly identical. The force from an electric charge and the force of a mass or gravity is very, very similar. So we can see that we have K, which is a constant, and we had G here, which was a constant. Then we looked in gravity at how masses are going to pull on each other, and now we're looking at how charges are going to pull on each other. And the bottom part's the exact same, that the force will decrease with the square of the distance or square of the radius between them. So they're really similar calculations and formulas. But now let's compare their strength on electrons. So we have these two electrons and we want to see the forces going on with the electric force and the gravitational force. So first let's plug into the electric force and I have Fe is equal to the constant 8.99 times 10 to the 9 times by the charge of these electrons, which we said each were 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. I need to know there's gonna be a repulsive force because they're both negatives, they will repel. And I divided by a distance of 1.0 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. This is about the diameter of an atom. So if we had two atoms together, the electrons could be this far apart. I make sure we do square the radius and I get a number of 2.3 times 10 to the negative eight newtons. So to the negative eight doesn't seem super big, and that's our repulsive force on the electrons. Now let's look at the gravitational force. These two masses are gonna be attracted to each other. We saw this last year from gravity. So let's plug into the equation. My constant for gravity is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. The masses of an electron from your data sheet are 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. And again, the same radius apart. When I plug that in, I get 5.54 times 10 to the negative 51. So a pretty small attractive force between these electrons. The gravity isn't going to keep them together. The electric force is going to push them apart. Now just to compare how much different these are, you may look at like 51 compared to 8 and say, yeah, it's quite a bit bigger, but this is also an exponent. Like let's look at how much different this is. If we're going to divide 2.3 times 10 to the negative 8 by 5.54 times 10 to the negative 51, see how many times greater this force is, we get an answer 4.1 times 10 to the 42. Just to see what that looks like, that is this number. 
4.1 times 10 to the 42 is way, way, way bigger. So the electric force is so much bigger than the gravitational force, incredibly bigger in this scenario than this force on the electrons. And that's the forces involved in things like lightning and we get these huge explosions, things that are hotter than the sun. And so that's the conclusion of today's video. Your practice questions will involve calculations with Coulomb's law. Again, it will be similar to your gravitational ones from last year. Maybe asked to rearrange and solve for different variables, but hopefully this will help you with those practice questions. Thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.